Do you know how sometimes a word or phrase in the Bible will just leap out at you? There you are reading along, trying to stay awake, and suddenly something will speak to you so loud and clear. You cannot believe that you never saw it before in just that way. It happened to me last Monday afternoon when I was sitting down and beginning my study for today's sermon. I went to a nearby coffee shop, got a cup of coffee, sat down at a table, arranged my things, opened my Bible to John 2, 13, took a sip of coffee, and began to read. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So far, so good. But then I read the next phrase. In the temple he found people selling cattle. And I almost spewed hot coffee all over the sacred page. He did what, I thought? Found people selling cattle in the temple? I put on my reading glasses just to check. But it was still there. Jesus found people in the temple selling cattle. I wondered what it would take to come to a place where that seemed normal to anybody. Because I can almost guarantee they didn't sell cattle in the first temple. Do you remember that one? They called it the tabernacle, another word for tent. God gave Moses the instructions for it just after he had made his covenant with his people out there in the wilderness. If you read those chapters in Exodus, they will bore you almost to tears because for ten chapters, God gives these detailed instructions about how to build the tabernacle. And then for ten more chapters, we learn how the workmen did everything God commanded in just the way God commanded it. It can lull you to sleep. But if you have ears to hear it, here is God laying out the plans for the honeymoon suite where he and his people will celebrate their wedding in the wilderness. The tabernacle is that place where the presence of God will reside in their midst so that God and his people can become intimately acquainted with one another. As it says in Revelation 21, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with people. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Where do you think the writer of Revelation got that idea? From this story, from this tabernacle in the wilderness. The plans for the tabernacle are elaborate. They call for curtains of fine twisted linen with blue, purple, and crimson yarns. They call for upright supports made of acacia wood resting in silver bases. They call for crossbars overlaid with gold, supported by five pillars with golden capitals resting on pedestals of bronze. You better believe they weren't selling any cattle in that place. You get the feeling that if one stray goat wandered close to the tabernacle, it would be struck dead by lightning. This was a holy place, a sacred place. This was none other than the house of God. At the end of the book of Exodus, when the tabernacle has been completed, it says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This was the understanding among the people from that day forward, that the tabernacle was where the glory of God resided. That portable temple went with them as they wandered from place to place, and eventually ended up in the promised land at a place called Shiloh, which was more or less its permanent home until David moved it to Jerusalem sometime later. He wanted to build a proper temple for God in Jerusalem. But God gave that job to his son Solomon, 
who built a magnificent temple, the same temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., when they carried God's people away into exile. The people who returned from that exile tried to rebuild the temple, but what they built was nothing so grand as Solomon's. That wouldn't happen until King Herod got involved in the building project nearly 500 years later and built the temple that people could be proud of, sitting at the center of this broad, elevated plaza that took up nearly five football fields in Jerusalem. I have a feeling that that's where it started. On that broad plaza, the temple precincts, that somebody set up a stall in one isolated corner and began to change Roman coins into Hebrew shekels so that people could pay the temple tax because you couldn't pay that tax with Roman coins. You had to have shekels. Necessity is the mother of invention. Somebody may have put up a stall for that purpose and then somebody else, seeing that example, may have set up another stall on the other corner selling doves and pigeons to people who forgot to bring their offering with them when they came to worship. And one thing led to another, and then another, and before you know it, somebody is putting up a stall selling hats and postcards and souvenir t-shirts. You know how these things happen. You make one small concession after another until the temple precincts in Jerusalem have become the biggest noisiest flea market in all of Israel. When I was in Jerusalem last month, I went up on that broad, elevated plaza that looks out over the city. It was quiet up there that day. I was able to walk across those smooth, flat paving stones from one end to the other in the sunshine, offering up my prayers. Nothing but peace and quiet up there. But when my little group and I stepped off that plaza into the Jewish quarter of the old city, suddenly we were on narrow streets and on either side of the streets these booths where people were selling everything that can be sold fruits and vegetables, meat and fish, trinkets and souvenirs. I saw a t-shirt hanging outside one of those shops that said, University of Alabama in Hebrew. (laughs) And underneath the slogan, Roll Tide. (laughs) I took a picture of it and sent it to Phil Mitchell, whose son is a student at the University of Alabama. There may have been in that same shop a t-shirt with a pouty picture of the pop singer Fergie on it, looking into the camera and licking a lollipop, and above her head the word Fergalicious, and down at the bottom the definition, make them boys go loco. (laughs) It's not really the kind of thing you would expect to find in the Jewish quarter of the holy city, but at least it wasn't up there where the temple used to be. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, he went into the temple and he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And the difference between what he saw and what he might have wanted to see was so upsetting that he couldn't just stand there. He had to do something about it. And so he made a whip of cords. I was reading that in the coffee shop on Monday afternoon and stopped again. Really? Jesus made a whip of cords? In no other gospel account does Jesus seem so outraged by what he sees or so determined to set things right. John says, making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Whew. 
We Christians sometimes imagine that Jesus never got angry. And we think it's because anger is a sin, and we know that Jesus never sinned. But there is a kind of anger that is not a sin. It's called righteous indignation. It means getting angry for the right reasons, and this was one of those. In this gospel, Jesus doesn't say, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but he makes it clear that whatever his father's house is supposed to be, it isn't supposed to be this, a Ferga not so licious flea market. <laughs> Made me think about this place and its purpose. We sometimes say here that we are working to bring the kingdom of heaven to Richmond, Virginia. And we say that we are doing that through the ministries of invitation, formation, worship, compassion, and community. Is this place a part of that purpose? I think it is. When I think about the ministry of Christian invitation, for example, I think about our gym and how just yesterday it was full of children and parents who came here for upward basketball. People not associated with our church who have found a way in through that ministry. I thought about our courtyard and how in the month of August we invite the neighbors to come and join us for classic films. But even more than that, I thought about every door that opens outward from this building into the world. And I thought about how I'd like to throw them open and invite the whole world in. How I'd like to throw them open so that we could go out and share the love of Christ with anybody who might need it. When I think about the ministry of Christian formation, I think about all those classrooms in our building, dozens of them, from the nursery where people rock little babies and sing, Jesus loves me, to the senior adult suite where we continue to form disciples in the image of Christ for the sake of others. When I think about the ministry of Christian worship, I think about this room and about our chapel and how both spaces are dedicated to the worship of God and both spaces are designed with worship in mind. This organ, this piano, these pews, this pulpit, that table, that baptistry, all of these are meant to point us toward God and help us give the best we can in our worship. When I think about the ministry of Christian compassion, I think about that big room down on the lower level of this building where we welcome some 75 homeless neighbors three times a week for hot showers and clean clothes and a cup of coffee and a fresh pastry and a generous helping of the love of Christ. I think about our divorce recovery workshop and all the other groups that we host in this place so that people can get better healthier, happier, stronger. And that's just what we do inside the building. When I think about the ministry of Christian community, I think about our dining hall where we have shared so many good meals together and so much good conversation around the tables. But I also think of the Adams Room where on Wednesday night a group of people sit down to pray for you and for the ministries of this church. I think about that long, long hallway out there, which isn't even really a room, but is a place where we bump into each other again and again and catch up with each other and often offer each other holy hugs. This building at the corner of Monument and the Boulevard is being used to bring heaven to earth and to train us for the work of kingdom bringing enrichment and beyond. Is it fulfilling its sacred purpose? I think it is. And for that reason, I think we should do whatever it takes to keep it beautiful and functional. But I also think we should do whatever it takes to remain vigilant. Because it is too easy to forget our purpose and to fall away from God's intentions. It is possible that Jesus could walk into this place one day and start turning over tables 
asking, how did you let my father's house turn into this? And we might say, as those people said all those years ago, what sign can you show us for doing these things? Or in other words, what gives you the right to come in here and mess with our church? Jesus said to those people, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And they couldn't believe it. That temple had been under construction for 46 years. But John says that Jesus was talking about the temple of his own body. And John should know what he's talking about. Do you remember how he says in the first chapter of this gospel that the word became flesh and lived among us? The Greek word that is translated lived is a word that means literally to pitch one's tent or to tabernacle. If you remember that first tabernacle, built as the place where the glory of God would reside among his people, it is not hard to think of Jesus as the person in whom the glory of God would reside among his people. He tabernacled among us, John says, and we have beheld his glory, glory as of the Father's only Son. Was his temple his tabernacle living up to its purpose? I don't think there's any question about it. In fact, the only question that's left is whether you and I are living up to ours. Because in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? So the glory of God could be found in that first tabernacle in the wilderness. It could be found in the temple in Jerusalem, at least initially. It could be found in the person of Jesus, the one who tabernacled among us. But can it be found in you? Or is there some cleansing that needs to take place first? A few weeks ago, just before the pastoral prayer, Lynn Turner invited us to pray silently. And for whatever reason, I began to imagine my life as a house and Jesus walking into it. And the first thing he did was to throw open every window and every door to let the fresh air and sunshine in. And then he began to drag every piece of clutter out of the house and throw it onto the front lawn until the house was empty. Then he began to scrub down the walls and began to sweep the floors until the whole house was clean and bare. Only then did he begin to bring back in again the things that should be in my life, the things that will make for the good and beautiful life I want so much to live. I wonder if I could end the sermon like that today. If I could ask you to bow your head in prayer and to picture your own life as a house. I wonder if you would let Jesus come in to do some holy housekeeping, to throw open the windows and the doors, to scrub the walls and sweep the floors, to throw out everything that has kept you from living the good and beautiful life and fill it with the things that will. Can we do that? Shall we pray? Distractions. The 
that would take our eyes from you. Jesus, clear the temple, make our worship true. Jesus, clear the temple, make our Amen.